post planet and economies. And it's a super important topic that we're going to discuss today. And I'm really pleased that we have three expert panelists who are joining us today, who are going to go in depth about what the circular economy is, what it means for the postal sector and the opportunities for the postal sector to be part of the circular economy, to enable the circular economy and do some good for the planet. Uh, it's, as you all know, a, a Zoom webinar. So please don't wait till the very end to ask your questions. If you have questions as you go on, go to the Q&A section, which is somewhere on your screen, probably down towards the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A section. Ask your questions in there, and I'll keep an eye on the questions, and if they're good, I'll put them to our panelists. Um, I'm making it sound like I'm a little bit elitist there, but no, ask your questions as we go along. Don't wait till the end, and it'll help us stimulate the discussion as we go along. As I said, we've got three great panelists today. They're going to share some great knowledge and expertise with us. So it's an opportunity to ask the questions that you want answered. Uh, to help you, whether you're a postal operator, whether you're a government, whether you're a regulator, whatever role you have in the postal sector to uh, help enable and benefit from the concepts of the circular economy. Well, I might now take the opportunity to introduce our three panellists. Uh, first joining us is Janet Salem. Janet has been working with the United Nations on environmental sustainability over the last 16 years and is currently focused on circular economy and innovation. She established the Asia Circular Economy Leadership Academy and the Asia Pacific Low Carbon Lifestyles Challenge, a startup competition for entrepreneurs with alternatives to single use plastics and carbon intensive products. So Janet, welcome, great to have you with us. Next is Stefan Sikars. Stefan, and many of you would recall that I interviewed Stefan on the UPU voicemail uh, podcast. Oh, when was it, Stefan? Two months ago? Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it, mate? <laughs> 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 Stefan Sikars is Managing Director in the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, or UNIDO, as some of you would know it, where he is responsible for environment and energy. He and his organization have for many years been strongly engaged in the circular economy. And this is because the UNIDO sees circular economy as a rare opportunity to simultaneously boost economic development and help the environment, including, but not limited to, combating climate change, a phrase that's going to come up during our conversation today, no doubt. Stefan, welcome. And last but not least, James Chin Moody. James is co-founder and CEO of Sendal, a global parcel delivery service for small business dedicated to delivering shipping that's good for the world. James, that sounds like a tagline you've just made me read out. Uh, dear ODS, Sendal is the first 100% national car national yes national carbon neutral delivery service in the US and Australia, and was Australia's first technology B corporation. Previously, James has held roles as executive director of development at the CSIRO, uh, as well, which is Australia's national research agency. He was co-chair of the United Nations Environment Program Youth Council an Australian National Commissioner for UNESCO and co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Digital Economy and Society. He's an expert and leading thinker on the interface between sustainability and innovation. And that's key, it's going to be what we're going to talk about today as well, so innovation, sustainability and opportunities. And is the co-author of The Sixth Wave, How to Succeed in a Resource Limited World, probably available on Amazon or something like that. I haven't introduced myself, everybody, that's the, the arrogance of the man. I assume that everybody knows me. Uh, my name's Ian Kerr. I'm the host of the UPU voicemail podcast. I'm also host of the Postal Hub podcast, podcast, <laughs> and co-host of the Last Mile Profits video series. And or just Google me and you'll see all the interesting and unusual things that I get up to. So welcome to everybody from wherever you are around the world. Uh, lots of people from South Sudan, um, Bhutan, welcome. And uh, wherever you are in the world, whatever time zone you're in, great to have you with us. If you're in New Zealand, you might already be in your, your pajamas. Who knows? <laughs> so um, enough of that idle chit chat. Let's get stuck into things. Uh, Janet, now that I've given you that great introduction, how about uh, you'd be so kind to just share with us some thoughts on what the circular economy is and maybe perhaps how it relates to the logistics and postal sector. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much, Ian. Gosh, you've got a 
good voice for podcasts. I'm going to have to find that. Um, let me um, start. Hopefully that's sharing right. Um, let me start with just a few little um, visuals on circular economy. So yeah, nice, nice to hear, see you all. Every um, I'm calling in from Sydney and from the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. What I wanted to run through was why is the future going to be more circular? And there are a lot of rationales for it on environmental grounds because processing too many materials that are going to be used once or headed to landfill certainly has a lot of um, environmental impacts, contributes to climate change, um, particularly through scope three emissions um, and causes a lot of waste and pollution. I deal with that day to day in my job, but sometimes that doesn't convince people. So I'm going to give you the non environmental environmental reasons why all of these products here, which are currently designed to be linear, are in the future going to be circular. So first of all, the linear economy works like this. You take um, resources out of the ground. They look a little bit like this in the case of phones. Um, and then we make perfect products for the point of sale. Um, that, that particular optimization is just for the point where a purchase is made. But of course, down the track, it ends up something like this. Um, and it's no, there's no way to bring it back into the economy, um, really. So what does that mean? It means in 2015, we took 80 billion tonnes of materials out of the earth through mining, agriculture, forestry, fisheries. Um, and at this rate, we're heading towards almost double that. So just try to imagine doubling all mining, um, agriculture, forestry and fishery. I think no one really believes that's going to work. So um, there's a number of reasons why. The first is scarcity. There is actually geological scarcity. Are we going to run out of all of these minerals? Maybe not, but that doesn't mean that we don't have scarcity. One of the indicators of that is that ore grades are declining. We used to be able to pull copper out of the ground at an ore grade of 1.6%, uh, and now it's um, getting closer to 0.9%, so almost double the amount of materials need to come out of the ground to get the same output. Um, the mines, the, all the good mines are gone. Mines in the middle of nowhere, easy to access, etc. Now we have to get a little tricky. So the mines are also getting deeper. These bubbles show the depth and size of different um, ore grades. That's going to be more expensive. Also, um, there be, the deposits are now in increasingly awkward places. So we're seeing the cases of significant mining and community conflict increasing over time. The deposits are where they are and happen to overlap with where people are. So sometimes they're in really awkward places. So sometimes I say, what do asteroids, the deep sea and cute Swedish towns have in common? Um, they are all fair game for mining. So that's how much we're looking for new materials to feed this linear economy. Um, they're all locations where there is um, resource extraction. There is also geopolitical scarcity, so their um, de deposits are not spread equally. So some countries have um, a majority, uh, have a monopoly on some critical materials, particularly for minerals and metals. And that's why all of these reasons combined, um, the we're not going to have a linear economy in the future. There'll be increasing pressure for a circular economy. So what do people think of when they think of a circular economy? Recycling. Well, there's actually um, a lot of different circular economy strategies. So I just wanted to give a brief overview. Um, Ian, don't worry, I won't go too into details. Um, but I'd say that there's five different categories. Consuming means it's gone, it might be some forms of waste. Um, whereas using means that it's, we're not actually consuming it. Um, so what we can do is to stop this all of these um, lines into the waste and emissions, we can circle it back up the chain, up the, the supply chain through different strategies. The first one is just low emission production and design. So getting switching from um, switching to renewables, those non-renewables are limited as I mentioned, um, digitizing, switching to refill, 
Um, now for the postal, and now suddenly I've gotten relevant, um, for the postal sector, it makes a big difference where the refill is happening. It can either happen at home or at the retailer. Um, so postal is getting involved in um, delivering sachets and refills. Um, also matters who does it, is it the user or the producer? Um, product service systems where um, instead of bikes, you use the bikes. Um, shifting things to be compostable or just having low emission production in general. Um, then you have this first loop, which is the highest value loop, and it yet doesn't yet involve po the postal sector as much. Um, it's about one user and with themselves. So it's a really a matter of um, extending a product lifespan, repairing things, restyling things, going for multifunctional devices that replace other things or clothing, say, um, or buying timeless items that don't become socially obsolete. Now, where the postal sector is now really ramping up is in the second loop, where the item um, is not used all the time by a user, it goes back to the service provider and then to a new user. So we're seeing a huge surge in the swap market, which is peer to peer or secondhand retail where um, the product goes back to that service provider. They may have purchased it or provide the platform to get to a new user. Or there's rental, we're seeing clothing rental, bike rental, share economy or donations um, when you think something doesn't really have a sale value. Um, and that's where I think it's going to be really interesting. I will say that there's another loop if, if you know, once a product is not usable in its current format, you can either refurbish it where you fix it up, make it new, or you can remanufacture it, which is now the big trend, which is to bring it up to that next gen. Um, or finally, the lowest value loop is to render a product as a mere set of parts or materials. Um, so that's the recycling loop where you can either upcycle, recycle or downcycle. So I will um, pause there and just finish with just saying that these loops depend a lot on data and uh, logistics. So all of these loops are moving things around and that needs to be optimized. It's currently not very easy to do that um, and not very efficient. So here comes the postal sector with all the solutions. Handing it back to you, Ian. Oh, you're on a mute. Yes. There we go. Sorry about that. Everybody just missed my witty joke that I just made. Uh, it's all right, everybody. I didn't really make a witty joke, but no. It's very. Thank you very much, Janet, for that excellent overview of the the circular economy concept, and indeed sharing how the postal sector can play a role in this in this model. So, um, I won't I won't waste time on any further comments from me. I'll hand straight over to you, Stefan, if you'd like to. Uh, make some opening remarks, talking about why the future has to be circular and uh, any other comments you might have that are relevant to the logistics world. And even if you have an example that you'd like to share with us, Stefan, over to you. Thank you so much. And I will also use the opportunity uh, offered by Zoom to share my screen. Uh, and uh, in doing so, I take effectively another uh, way of depicting a circular economy and maybe add a little bit different uh, accent to what just uh, Janet has explained. You see in the middle uh, of the picture, essentially the circular economy, you can make different graphs, but essentially it comes to the same thing. All of this is about product life. And, and if you take a step back and don't bother about the details for a moment, uh, what you have going into the product is uh, resources, what you end up with is waste, and what you want to have out of it is utility. Uh, these are essentially your, your, critical, your critical elements. And essentially, when people talk about resource efficiency or something like that, they refer to effectively uh, the amount of resources taken to achieve a certain utility. And if you use less resources in, then you get less waste out. And the way to do that is to circulate the resources endlessly through the product life, repeated and repeated. Now, <clears throat> from my perspective and what I can see, uh, the logistics sector that we look at is very much linked to the utility end of the spectrum, or let's say they are the immediate um, 
opportunities that they are, in particular postal operators with their with their limitations on uh, size and with their extremely good outreach to many consumers, is uh, of course an, an area where specific opportunities arise a lot, in my view. Now, if you look at this overall picture, and I don't need to go into the details, I believe, other than saying, uh, indeed, after the distribution of the first uh, of the product to the first user, and then in the use phase, you have this repair, the reuse, the remanufacture, as said before. And uh, why I have a different take, same message, different takes, and Janet has to the question of of resources. Um, four pictures here. Um, you see on the top left, uh, a copper mine actually, um, and forestry. Top right is a palm oil plantation, steel production in the middle of the bottom, and on the right side, petrochemical plant, in this case, plastic production. Um, you see on the bottom. What do all of these tell us? Uh, that you cannot create resources without doing things to nature and the planet. Um, and I think we learned, if you, if you look at what, what the environmental movement did over the last maybe 50 years, and we learned for maybe the last 25, still learning, uh, that actually the globe has certain limits. That means that plantations like this, that, that copper mines like that, are not a dot in the endless surface of the earth, but that they're big enough to actually make a substantial difference to a degree that the earth changes its characteristics. And the energy supply you can see in producing here steel, I would have loved to find a picture for aluminum, but I didn't, um, but steel is fine. You can see, you can just see how much energy goes into it. So why not using the steel, the palm oil, the copper or the plastics more efficiently than we do. And with that, creating an immediate and massive drop in impact. You can, in the production of any of these, increase your efficiency as much as you want. The most efficient way is always to avoid, avoid using the product in the first place. And circular economy can avoid tremendous amount of resource use. If you're extending the lifetime of any product by a factor of two, you have saved half of the resources, half. I'm not talking about 5% improvement in efficiency of 10. You have half your resources. And that is, uh, well, very strictly speaking, maybe a tad less than that because you have certain uh, costs going for making the circular economy work, but more or less that is accurate. And if you manage to add two, three, four lives to the lifetime of your product, it's even stronger so. So this is why circular economy is needed. And actually, if you look at the numbers, now these are derived from a, a publication from the EMF and material economics from Sweden. If you look at it, and if you look at climate change, essentially the energy side is linked to about 55% uh, of the uh, CO2 emissions products to around 45%. There are many ways of calculating that you might end up three or four or five percent less or right, but it doesn't matter if you if you want to impact on our overall emissions, you have to deal with products and that means you have to deal with resources. Uh, that's essential and in order to deal with resources, the best way of doing it is circular economy. So that is the why will it stay with us and then how does it relate to the postal sector? So last year, Christmas, we bought a new computer. We wanted to buy a new com computer. So we found this. I uh, tried to eliminate every mentioning which would indicate which manufacturer that was. Um, but uh, uh, it's, of course, lockdown time. So in general, postal service use is up tremendously. And we ordered the new time by mail, the new item by mail, and we wanted to trade in our old computer, same brand, and um, we got one of these packages. The so first thing, uh -huh, the manufacturer would like to have this back either for remanufacturing or for complete recycling or whatever it might be. 
So if you do that, you have a month to send it back. We were moving at the same point in time. We missed the timeline, opportunity gone. Second thing, we put it on a platform like eBay and sold it to someone else, used, you know, was seven years old, but nowadays computer lasts quite a bit with decent quality. And how did we get it to the other person? Of course, using mail. And uh, this, this gives you an, I mean, we are really at the very beginning of circular economy. And uh, actually, we had some discussions here in preparation for, for our discussion today. Uh, electronics is probably at this point in time, the easiest target specifically for the postal sector because you have uh, a very high value product, uh, which is fairly compact. Um, you would not send around uh, motors of mining equipment by mail. But uh, this utility, which at the moment is great for mobile phones, computers, and so, and so on, games maybe, um, I mean, um, this will expand, of course, to more and more products of lower and lower value. And all of these have to be collected one way or the other at the consumer. Of course, the consumer will have to do something on this, maybe at least. But they have to find their way from the consumer to someone else, whether that is a trader, whether that is another consumer, whether that is a repair shop, someone who remanufactures and uh, or recycles. And all these moves or a lot of these moves will come through the postal service and they increasingly will come outside the world of electronics to more and more products. I would assume um, everything which has a value of let's say hundred dollars or more and can be put in a parcel, but maybe James can enlighten us there, uh, might be worthwhile shipping around because even even with a certain amount of shipping costs, the alternative is you lose whatever value is remaining in this product completely if you waste it. It becomes a liability, actually. Well, if you send it somewhere else to get a new life or to get material out of or whatever you do, you have a remaining value which is sizable. And as long as sending it around the world is substantially cheaper than the remaining value of the product, this will happen. And this is, I think, where the Postal Service comes in. Back to you, Ian. Stefan, thank you very much for that and for the, that uh, unbranded example you shared at the end. Uh, and certainly it's uh, the, the idea of reusing and recycling uh, uh, you know, electronic devices, consumer electronic devices is a fantastic one. James, I'm going to throw straight to you so you can share a few more comments before we open up to a, a wider discussion. So, James, do you want to make some brief comments as well on the circular economy and the role of logistics and delivery and so on, please? Over to you, James. Yeah, thanks, Ian. Look, it's an honour and a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to also share my screen for a very important slide because I think it's fairly obligatory. Um, so I'm going to start by asking, here's the circular economy, everyone. What does every single, there's a lot, if you Google circular economy, you find lots of such things. What does every single circular economy slide has two things in common? Every diagram, I should say, has two things in common. Can you guess what they are? Number one is they all have circles, surprisingly enough, for the circular economy. Well, what is the second thing that all circular economy diagrams have? They all have arrows, right? You don't have the circular economy without the circles and without the arrows. And the reason why I point that out is because the arrows, everybody, is logistics. The very heart of the circular economy I will put to you all today is actually is logistics. And the reason for that is, and I'll, I can finish my obligatory circular economy slide now. The reason for that is because um, basically, I think one of the central tenets of the circular economy is that unless you move something, it is not valuable. It's only valuable, often something is waste or unusable in one place, but the moment you move it is often when it becomes valuable and you can use it again. Some of Janet's different circles. If you think about most of those circles, we're often moving the location of the item. And a good example, um, you know, some that I love is, is Bureo, um, for example, is a company that takes the ghost nets in the Philippines, right? These are the large fishing nets that again, can destroy habitat. But once you move them, you can actually turn them into skateboards and games and frisbees, right? They actually become valuable. They become feedstock for another service. 
And so from the very center of the business, you know, the, the, I mean, Janet's talked about some of the business models. I, I like to think about, you know, um, value creation because I'm, you know, ultimately an entrepreneur. <laughs> um, but really what the circular economy does is it enables some really significant business models, right? The first is that waste is opportunity, right? You can take waste in one part of the, the system and you can actually turn it into opportunity again by moving it. Thread up's an example here. Of a build of a business that basically creates brands to to you know with through resale or donation mailer bags that actually get put with every single clothing purchase right you're building the logistics you're building the movement into the into the actual service um, another one is that you know bits are global but atoms become very local right reuse I mean our, our entire business Sendle actually didn't start as a logistics company it started as a company that was a, a, a giving network where people could give things they no longer needed to each other. But what we quickly found is that if you didn't actually include the logistics, which is how Sendle became, you know, a, a small business parcel delivery company, right, you actually couldn't create the value. And I think, you know, your final loop, um, Janet, you know, if you think about, you know, the other one is, you know, circular economy models are very much about nature. And again, take a feedstock from one and turn it into, sorry, take a waste from one process and turn it into feedstock for another. There's a good example is TerraCycle. Again, doesn't work without logistics. They're taking really hard to process amounts of waste, moving them to the place where they need to be. So um, what does it all mean for logistics? And then I'll probably finish. I think it means there's, there's three big lessons or big three, and, and probably many more, but I take away three things. One, you know, even logistics networks were often built for the linear model, right? They were normally often point to point models where you often, I mean, even think of large courier companies often start off as, I think, a warehouse to retailer, right? Lots of stuff to lots of stuff, point to point. Whereas what we found when we built out our network, you know, it needs to be multi-point to multi-point. You need networks that can actually deal with multiple inputs and leading to multiple outputs, multi-point to multi-point networks. Um, super interesting. I think the second one, is you start having to deal with things like MOQs of one, minimum order quantities of one logistics. And this is very linked to multi-point to multi-point. But if you think about it, it's all about understanding how you could get density. And, you know, imagine if you could have as much stuff leaving houses as going into houses. And, you know, Stefan just talked about doubling the efficiency. You can actually double the efficiency in some ways of your last slash first mile by having that, you know, by increasing the amount of density through circular economy models. Um, and I think the third one is, uh, you know, basically none of this works for the environment, well, I mean, some of it works for the environment, but basically without logistics actually also taking responsibility for its own emissions, for its own waste. And, and I think that one of the things you start to think about is how do you reduce the harm of logistics, right, in both upstream and downstream effects. You know, upstream is thinking about things like packaging. Um, you know, I know we launched compostable, compostable satchels for all of our customers. We were the first in Australia to do so in the US, right? It was, you know, really important because you actually have to think about the impacts, but also downstream, like what are the carbon emissions? This is why from day one, we were always carbon neutral, but now we're looking at carbon intensity and converting parts of our network to 100%, to um, you know, renewable energy. And, and I think it's, it's inherent on the, the entire um, logistics and postal world. To, to really start grappling with how does it get to net zero and how quickly can it get to net zero. So I hope that's useful, Ian. I'm really looking forward to the, the conversation. You've made a couple of really important points there too, James, that uh, things like the packaging that we see, there's been a boom in e-commerce, which has meant a boom in packaging. What happens to that packaging? We think it gets recycled, but what really happens to it? What happens to packaging that's been contaminated by fire, whatever reasons it makes us non-recyclable anymore? We might come to that in a moment, but there's a question that's coming from the audience. And uh, Janet, I know you've already answered it by tapping out the answer on your keyboard, uh, but I want, I'd like to bring out a couple of points there. James just mentioned about the arrows in these diagrams uh, that, that basically represent the logistics and that when you move an item from one place to another, that can contribute to creating value. And the questions that come in from uh, Christine is, what can posts do to help encourage the second loop that you described, Janet? You, can you just share a little bit about what, what how, how that, <laughs> I'll get out in a second. <laughs> just um, share a bit of information about that for everybody, please. 
Yeah, I think, um, well, James's point is really important. I mean, because you're going to people's houses, you can also take stuff back with you that probably wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and that little nudge or that little bit of latent capacity there um, is something that's probably still untapped um, that James can maybe mention more. But for me, what the, the post is, it's actually the lifeblood of the secondhand market, especially as it moves online. And we've all seen those, well, at least in, in, in my industry we have, we're seeing those big numbers of the growth of the secondhand market, particularly online, so the re-commerce market. And it, the reason that's so good for the circular economy is because if you go to a secondhand shop near you, it's usually not a great retail experience because you don't have everything, you don't have exactly what you need. So you're very limited with bricks and mortar to very local supply um, and demand. And so a lot of stuff just doesn't really follow that arrow. <laughs> the arrow doesn't get complete. Um, whereas if you, if you introduce efficient logistics and ideally clean logistics, um, then you have a much larger interface between supply and demand. And that means that the online secondhand um, shopping experience becomes a much more satisfying user, user experience um, for consumers and hopefully will pull uh, consumers away from um, buying things new and towards buying things secondhand online. Um, also just the economy of scale. Once, once you, Now that things are changing, the growth is there, the investments are being made, this is the opportunity to also grab that opportunity and go with uh, greener fleets um, or use that latent value of the waste that's already in the fleets um, and low, low impact packaging. Yeah, just a few other things, many more things to say on that, yeah. You mentioned uh, fashion there, the, uh, re, what's it called Thread Up, and there are various others. The Vinted, I think, is another one. Uh, and we've seen also some of the major e commerce fashion retailers like Zalando and one other that doesn't immediately spring to mind have started offering the opportunity to, to take clothes back. And we hear so often about clothing being a, a the, the disposal of clothing um, and, and various aspects relating to the textiles industry being a problem. And uh, perhaps I could throw it open to everybody now, looking at textiles and fashion uh, and that moving from the linear to the circular economy, what kind of role uh, could the post play in enabling all of that, uh, um, whether it's from a marketplace perspective or um, setting up a first mile slash last mile delivery network. Um, look, James, I might throw to you first of all, and then um, Stefan, after James has had his say, I'm going to throw to you. Yeah, look, I think the, you know, I'll, I'll go back to the, the, the central concept that, you know, most of these things, um, you know, start with minimums of one. In fact, our business actually began because it's really hard problem. You know, this is often the opposite of where we do think of most of the things, right? We're talking about one thing at a time. It has to be exceedingly cheap, I'm afraid. It has to be exceedingly easy. So it's often door to door, right? And it has to be built for an audience that doesn't really, you know, doesn't do that as their day job. <laughs> you might say sending items, right? And it's, you know, it's, and it has to be ubiquitous. So a lot of these things, right? Like you think about it, that's a very difficult set of conditions. And you know, how do you build those networks that are actually going to make that happen? So um, again, posts, um, you know, are like a lot of different models. And, and indeed, our entire business was built on this idea of minimums of one and for everyone, right? Let's democratize logistics, let's open it up so that everyone can get access to you know, things like both delivery from their door, but actually now we're talking about reverse logistics as well. Um, I think there's a massive important role um, to play around democratizing access to that, that service. And Stefan, do you want to make some comments generally on things like the, the fashion sector or the textiles industry and how currently it is a very linear process that there is a concern that you know, clothes at end of life just end up in landfill? Um, what can be done better overall for that industry? And, uh, and, and then again, how does logistics and the postal sector fit into that? Actually, uh, you would be surprised in, in reality. Uh, you would be surprised in reality in the fashion sector, there's a very sizable amount of pre-consumer waste as well, which is a material which is 
either lost during manufacturing, you know, the cutouts, you make a certain shape and you always lose like seven, eight percent of your material and it's gone, right? Meaning you cannot use this material easily for a new product. Secondly, um, you have the items which are not being sold and not all brands lend to um, sales at a substantially lower value. So you have warehouses full of unsold merchandise. It's really amazing and fashion. We are working a lot in that and I was really astonished. Um, certainly you have, of course, the after use fashion after consumer. Now, um, there is, of course, and there always has been a certain amount of consumer to consumer trade, um, brick and mortar shops often secondhand. But, but the real um, element here will be possibly and possibly not only in fashion, that you need the items to go back in order to do something with the materials. People frequently want not to have any shirt or any trouser or any skirt or any dress. They want to have something which looks specifically and possibly specifically different from how it looked three years ago. So simply reselling works only to a point. I mean, if you have a nice luxury label on it, maybe yes, but so, so what you need to do is you need to somehow disassemble it to some point in time, to, to some level and then reassemble it into new clothing typically. And that is increasingly possible. So there are a number of companies who are looking, we are, we are working with most of the larger brands, I would say, uh, on the textile value chain. There are a number of companies who are looking into disassembling um, clothing uh, first really in bits and pieces and reassembling it in a different fashion. That will of course mean if you have a piece of clothing which has a certain remaining value, you would have to get it to the manufacturer, to a remanufacturing plant, to someone who does something with it. And that's where the logistics comes in. And, uh, and it goes from clothing, which is meant for taking it apart into pieces and then reassembling, it goes down to threads, meaning increasing the amount of recycled uh, raw material in the threads of material to weave um, textile from, to make clothing from. Uh, all of these require industrial processes. And I think in terms of percentage of the clothing use, you will see um, with an increasing circular economy, the amount of clothing going back to manufacturers one way or the, or the other to be submitted to very serious back to the roots and then remake new clothing out of it, you will see that increasing dramatically simply because now it's low, it's not zero, because a number of large retail chains are offering or a few are offering already clothing take back in their shops. But this is quantity-wise not yet overly serious. The broader that goes, the more there is the need again to collect that clothing. And of course, uh, what is easy for me in a large town like a city like Vienna with one and a half million people to find the original brand shop and give something back, it's getting more complicated the more you live outside of these and the more exotic the brand is for your market. So you need logistics to give things back and increasingly so. Back to you. Uh, Brian, this is my comment here. Uh, Brian Wine. So hello, Brian. Posts have been handling returns in one form or another for, for many years. Um, the circular economy requires posts to enhance the value proposition of this unique capability that they've always had. So Brian, thank you for your comment. Um, we're going to open up a poll now. Uh, so everybody get ready. We're going to launch it. I can't remember where it's going to appear on your screen, but we will have a poll and uh, asking you uh, for your um, input on, maybe I can actually launch the poll. Can I? No, I can't. I'll wait for our IT people to launch the poll um, while we're waiting for it to come up. Uh, does anybody want to quickly comment on Brian's comment about um, how the posts have been offering the return service for a while? And this is sort of the next step in enhancement of what's, what's, what's already been happening. Uh, James or Janet, do you want to quickly comment on that while we're waiting for the poll to come up? I think you're spot on, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
there we go, Brian, you're spot on. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about that process is sometimes people bring in their, their goods as is, and then it has to be packaged up and returned. It gets brought in and maybe can be returned without packaging, which I think is an interesting development. We're seeing in a couple of markets where uh, parcels are being delivered, so e-commerce purchases are being delivered without packaging. So they're just being sent in the box, whatever it might be, whether you've bought a phone or whatever. Um, and then the returns can also be done without packaging. When I bought something off Amazon, oh, I've named a brand name. There you go. I bought something off, off Amazon. I had to return it. No packaging required. Dropped it off at the uh, at a, a, a Pudo point, actually, which we might get into a second. The poll has come up. Transition to net zero carbon emissions. When should posts transition to net zero carbon emissions? So there's the, the choice there. You've got uh, four choices. By 2030, by 2040, by 2050, or not sure. So vote, please, in the poll. Um, I can't vote. Um, but uh, perhaps while we get everybody's voting, uh, does anybody want to comment on what they think should be the target for posts when it comes to reaching net zero carbon emissions? Uh, Janet, you've unmuted yourself. Off you go. Is there anything wrong with today? <sighs> Let's talk realistically. They've got fleets of um, oh, yeah. massive James, diesel trucks travelling distances. Is it realistic so... today? I don't know. <laughs> Oh, okay. okay, let's rule out today and tomorrow. After tomorrow, what would a good target be? <laughs> no, well, um, I, I think I think we've got the votes coming in and I'll leave it up to the IT team to close the poll when we've got the votes coming in. It's interesting that, that some posts have not made any commitments at all. Uh, we saw Deutsche Post DHL make a commitment a few years ago and everybody thought, wow, that's impressive that they've made this commitment at a time when nobody else was making a commitment. Uh, more recently, I think it was Posty or Post Nord. Sorry, somebody from Posty or Post Nord is going to correct me. They've committed to uh, you know, science-based targets. Can somebody just enlighten us, though, while we're talking about this? When we hear the phrase science-based targets and things like that, um, how much of it is fluff and how much is substance? What, what's a genuine target and, and how do you measure it? Does anybody want to comment on that? Don't rush me. No one. Okay, I do it if no one volunteers. Go on then, Stefan. Uh, and, and that actually speaks also to the question um, posed to the audience. It's a distribution problem, right? Uh, I mean, you need to, you have a certain time period to go to zero and the assumption that everyone can be the very last one to change. That's of course the initial start, right? If everyone said, oh, we have to consistently go down, you know, in a line and in 2050 or 40 or 30, we need to be finished. Then everyone assumes that he will be, or she or they will be the last ones to have this little itsy bit, which deals with 2030. And so they can wait. And um, uh, the science base might create that ramp, that ramping down. But of course, there's the question who starts and who finishes. And your post asks, when should posts transition? Not any post. So collectively, it's a different thing from individually. Individually, I would fully side with Janet. Yesterday would be a great date uh, to commit to something. Collectively, that is probably utterly unrealistic um, because uh, in reality, if one would look at the postal system at all systems at a whole, one would have to come to a discussion who moves where, how fast in order to reach something. I think a fair target is probably an appropriate target would be 2030. I think if the postal system would be actually at zero, given that it's essentially transport at its heart, which is not so easy to reach zero. Uh, 2040 would be globally speaking, all postal systems. Last one switching off the light, so to say, 2040 would be probably doable, even if not overly um, ambitious maybe. And 2050 would be way too late. So there we have it. 2050 is way too late. That's here's a headline straight away. Um, 
Uh, another question for everybody, given that you've all in or have been involved in the UN, UN system, and have an un understanding of standards and those sorts of things, how can a body like the UPU or UNIDA or whoever it might be help all countries and all posts achieve these targets? But what, what can be done at a global level to assist people, no matter where they are in the world, whether you're in Europe or the South Pacific or wherever you are, um, achieve you know, these sorts of targets? Anybody want to share a comment on that? I'll, I'll throw out there, Ian, and I think, I mean, let's, let's, let's get real. I mean, I don't know, I'm looking at US transportation. Again, you can get the numbers all over the place. I believe that transportation is currently responsible for 29% of all global carbon of, of all carbon emissions in the US of greenhouse gas emissions. 29%. Right? So it's almost like this is also when you look at the science-based targets to, to what Stefan was talking about, right? That is really about trying to use the science to say when do we have to make an you know, when do we actually have to take action in order to make an impact? And what's the Pareto of those things that we need to do? Um, so I, I, I don't know if it's about um, you know. Uh, there, there will come a point we're seeing sentiment shift like mad, right? It only takes, um, you know, uh, hurricanes or bushfires or Texas freezing over or whatever it might be, sentiment is shifting like mad. Um, and I think that, you know, again, we've been 100% carbon neutral since 2014, right? We've worked it into our margin. I, I cannot see why the Postal Service can't actually start by doing that, like all posts, right? Why not? Right? Start actually taking responsibility for it and then working out how to reduce the intensity of emissions at the same time. So I don't think it's a matter. I mean, yes, 2050 is far too late. I think 2030 is far too late. 2025 would be really nice. And to, to Jan's point, the best time to start was yesterday. So an old proverb about a tree, isn't it? Now, uh, I understand we've got the results ready from the poll. So let's see what the audience says. There we go. 52% say by 2030, 15% say by 2040. We have 20% saying by 2050 and 13% not sure. So when should post transition to net, so net zero carbon emissions? Since our discussion today is so much about the circular economy, what, uh, how does the circular economy fit into the concept of net zero carbon emissions? Uh, I, I made that it's the, the sort of peas in a pod, are they? Who would like to comment on that? I should have picked the name. Well, Janet. James is well, yeah. It's I, going I, to turn into James show. If I give every question to James, it's going to turn into James show, I'm worried. <laughs> well, yeah, because he has gone um, net zero carbon, so you call it net zero carbon or carbon neutral. Um, I don't know, maybe you can share the steps of how, how you did it. Do you have a green fleet? Do you offset? Do you, you, you mentioned renewable energy, you mentioned low impact packaging. Um, was there a particular part of it that was, um, what's the first step, the no brainer and what's the hard bit? Yeah, look, I, I think the, the first step is actually starting to get a measurement I mean, we'll, we'll start with that, um, getting your arms around what measurement, what you're actually doing. And of course, we built it in from the very beginning. And that's a lot easier to do than, of course, um, you know, uh, having existing infrastructure that's sometimes 200 years old, I get that. Um, but the first step is measurement. And then the second step is then starting understanding the strategies, right? There's increasing, so and some of these strategies are interesting because they improve efficiency and reduce costs and reduce carbon emission, right? This is where you get the things lining up. If you look at your carbon abatement curves, there'll be some things in the carbon abatement curve that save you money, right? And there'll be some things that cost you money, right? It's really interesting as you start to get that measurement right. And, and a carbon abatement curve for everyone is where you basically look at, you know, the amount, the cost per kilogram of carbon or, or ton of carbon or whatever it might be. And you can start to plot that on a curve. And some of this stuff will be negative cost. Right? If we improve the utilisation of this network, or we fill that truck an extra way or whatever it might be, you'll actually save money. And of course, some of it, we're going to transition and you start crossing over at this point where it's going to cost you money. And sometimes that, that carbon abatement curve is, can actually, again, be net zero in terms of cost or whatever, you can even draw a line. There's all these really interesting things that you can do. And, and often there's market failures that are just preventing that carbon abatement curve because 
It's not economic rational. So that's the second thing. Then after that, under the, you start to think about these strategies and some of them, yes, they're, they're reducing costs. Some of them are going to be conversion. You know, so we worked with one of our suppliers um, where they basically realized, again, this is circular economy. Um, you know, courier companies own two things, right? There are lots of trucks and lots of depots. And guess what? The depots are sitting there with a waste resource of the solar energy on the roof. So why not use that resource to actually start charging the trucks, right? Bang, we're now getting rid of fuel surges, charges. Bang, we're insulating ourselves from you know, the, the future cost of fuel. And we're also earning our right to operate in a world where, that's taking carbon seriously. So that's the second with conversion. Then of course, you've got the rest. And, you know, we can't move immediately, but you know what, you can take responsibility immediately. And there is markets out there where you can then start to offset. So, so again, I, I think there's this intensity piece, reducing the intensity of the network and then taking responsibility for the rest. And that's the approach that we took, Janet. Yeah. The post, oh, sorry, Janet. No, no, he answered it perfectly. Go over to you. I was going to say was that posts don't exist in a vacuum. So posts will have the, the, the e-commerce retailers, for example, who are producing and injecting into the network. There will be the individual consumers who are, you know, it's, whether it's a C2C parcel, uh, who are also using the postal service. Uh, and the questions come in from Uzwin Ram. So waste recycling can create an opportunity However, there's a lack of such a market in the Pacific. How can posts play a leading role in creating a market, connecting recyclers? I think the broader question here is about the post in its role, maybe as connecting recyclers, as Uzwin has just said, but also creating awareness among suppliers and among consumers. Um, Janet, since it's the Pacific, as we mentioned, maybe I'll ask you to lead off on this one, please. So how, how can posts play a role in connecting recyclers or um, you know, even creating awareness in their various markets? Oh, it's a tough one because, um, I mean, there's no better place to implement a circular economy strategy than in a Pacific island, right? It's, it's expensive to bring stuff in. There's not a lot of places to dump your waste. So it's a, it's a circle, it's an island. So, you know, it is a lot of like, there's, there's a lot of rationale for a circular economy um, in, in Pacific islands. However, the, the postage is a, is a huge cost. So you might be, I think it is a little bit of a, a barrier the, um, for at least the product level or consumer facing circular economy strategies. Um, when it comes to shipping, um, that is the strategy of a lot of of um, small island states is that they do need to um, collect up their recycling and then ship it. However, um, it is now going to be very closely monitored. You cannot just export your waste. You have to transform it into something of value in order so under the Basel Convention changes that are coming. Um, you, you can't export waste. Um, there, there are some loopholes coming for um, emerging economies that might have a longer lag time. So I think that the, there's still an opportunity. I think that as long as uh, waste is well sorted and um, perhaps there can be initial pre-processing to ensure that those waste streams or those recycling streams are of high quality before they go onto ships um, or other forms of transport, um, that is still a viable, it is still a potential strategy. But ideally we, we design out the need for recycling um, where possible, like, you know, using compostable products, um, so that you don't have to have that reverse logistics, you know, it is either home compostable or maybe even um, industrial compostable um, in the case of Pacific Islands and you don't need to send back um, those waste products of a low value in expensive shipping lines um, just so that they can re-enter the circular economy. Um, yeah, that's what I'd say, not, not sure there's the best ideal solution out there. Stefan, do you want to add something on this? I think, thank you very much, Ian, and thank you, Janet. I, I, I think it's, um, we need to look a little bit more back into what circular economy is. And I very much warn to look predominantly at what we currently consider end of life and then feeding it back into, uh, somehow feeding it back one way or the other into a new beginning of life. That's part of it, but extension of life is very critical. And that means 
that very critical as in, I think this is actually where a very large part of the easy gains is. Extension of life means repairs. Um, so you need to train people to do repairs. That should be possible. And you need to have spare parts. How do you get spare parts? Um, of course, you mail them, right? Or you could at least mail them in particular because they will be single, um, like specific parts. Uh, I, I think the postal system, my impression, would be excellently suited for that, in particular towards an island. And you save with a spare part, you save sending a new, typically much larger equipment. So it is, in a way, uh, which might come by different routes, actually, than the postal service. So it is, uh, it is in a way, um, there where I see an additional task for the postal service, but not only on islands. In my perspective, a lot of people will move into make it into repairing products companies will move into making their products easier repairable and consequently uh, the means to do that possibly some specialized tools definitely spare parts need to reach wherever they can be repaired and in case of an island ideally you do of course all of that on location and it's likely that in many many islands there is sufficient market for repair services, even very specific repair services, to create a living and a meaningful business. So then you need to supply them. That's all you need to do. And as I said, postal service, ideally suited for that. I have my doubts, uh, as does Janet do, if at end of life, uh, the products, th th there is a, an economic case for shipping back the products easily. There might be there might be an economic case because waste is so expensive, it's such an expensive liability on islands that you have to figure out what to do with the stuff, possibly. But um, I think before that, what you do is you repair this instead of throwing it, and then you reduce your waste problem and uh, you increase actually the need for logistics. Back to you. Now, we've got a question here from James Hale. Hello, James. How are you? We've, it's, it's a really good one because it, co it covers a few of the things that we've all just talked about here, or you've all just talked about, uh, value thresholds. So uh, the value of the sell value to the seller of a second-hand item needs to be greater than the cost of the postage. So what happens when the postal cost for the seller is too high, whilst the environmental impact of disposing the item is also high? So where do we head from here? And, and James has raised the question, is there a role for a government subsidy? Um, and there are plenty of people who immediately, when yeah, they hear subsidy, they go, oh, like this, <laughs> right? Um, but uh, James, I might start with you because you mentioned before about the benefits of moving to, to um, a, a green model in delivery and how there's some things that you can do without costing money. Other things cost you money. How do you mix all that together? So the question is, how, how can you ensure that the dollar cost or euro cost or pesos or whatever it is that you've got <laughs> um, doesn't outweigh the the actual cost of just buying a new one of whatever it is that you're upcycling or recycling or reselling or whatever it might be so i'll start with you james and then we might move on to some, one of the other panelists for now some more thoughts it's a it's an excellent question because really a lot of this is you know is an economic argument and indeed you know the first business that we started that then turned into Sendal was literally a, a business that would find things that people had no residual value for like a bag of baby clothes and were basically you know for free they'd give it to someone else and the receiver would just have to pay the cost of postage right that was the model that we were creating so and and the, the threshold was literally is the value is the value the, the baby clothes worth more than the cost of the postage you know, we're playing with low residual values in that point. So, so it is very much, there's a threshold there. And of course, there's also market failures all over the place, you know, around where we're not even homo economicus of like, you know, economically rational things. There's, there's all this stuff that can happen. Um, I think the simple answer, there is a big rule for regulation potentially, but the rule for regulation is often around making sure that we see the true cost of the waste. Um, this is called internal, you know, externalities, right? And, and in many cases, um, if you think about what's the true cost of the carbon emissions that are in, that we're going to emit otherwise, right? That's the things that can actually tip those scales 
in that direction. And if you can increase that, then of course you're going to increase, increase the amount of value you get from reuse or the different loops that Janet's talking about. And then of course the flip side is what we can do, what can we do to reduce the cost of logistics? And that's where, as I mentioned, there's, there's a whole lot of things we could be doing. And you know, um, again, we're built on trying to create more efficient logistics, right? And and reverse logistics actually increases efficiency as well. So I think I think it is very good to be thinking about that that cost benefit. There are things you can do, but I think there's a strong role for role for regulation around internalizing externalities and and finding the market failures because that is ultimately the role of government. The role, you know, it, well, one of the roles of government is, is is think about these market failures and how we can actually that that are causing negative externalities to society. Stefan or Janet, do you want to jump in on this point? Janet, why don't you start? There we go. Well, I, I just wanted to say, you know, it is a question, should the post be cheap um, just because it's better than throwing something away um, or should we value the service um, of, of postage? Um, so I don't have the, the, the answer to that question, but I did want to also flag that related to this um, what happens when um, an item crosses a border and the cost of postage by the, um, the seller country is really low and then the receiving country then has to sort of complete that trip at this very low, low cost. Um, it sort of doesn't seem to reflect the true cost of um, postage. So I also wonder if that's sustainable or whether people are getting used to the fact that postage should be free or um, embedded into the price of the product. So I, I sort of don't, I don't know. And I actually see that there's some role here for, for the UPU, you know, what, is the cost determined by the selling, the, the selling, the postage service of the selling country or when it crosses that border and that receiving country postage service has to complete the trip at a really low price. Is that really fair? And what are the impacts of that? There are heads exploding across the postal world right now, Janet. <laughs> Stefan, before I jump in on this, do you want to have a quick comment, please? Yeah, I, I was so much enjoying because I just literally imagined these heads exploding on the comments from Janet, um, knowing that this discussion is actually happening here where I'm living and in other places. Um, but I think it's it's one which is not related to circular economy. The I'm, I'm taking things often literal. So circular economy is circular economy. It's not circular subsidy, right? The point is that you are creating a system where the economic benefits are helping you also to save the planet. And with that, you're kind of safe a little bit in enforcement and in subsidies and a lot of other things. And, and that is the idea behind circular economy or one of them. And which is of course, particularly appealing to us. We are a development agency. So we, we like that because enforcement is very different in different countries, but very basically speaking, a lot of uh, countries of the developing world have severe difficulties getting strong enforcement. So how would they move on economic incentives much better? So having said that, um, I think James is, I would like to, to uh, side with James on this in saying that if the externalities, the actual cost are properly reflected and the postage is too expensive to send something around, then possibly it shouldn't be sent around. Possibly it's not the item, that there will be items, there's no point in collecting every little screw from somewhere which has been used and send it back to the manufacturer if the effort to do this is actually outweighing the benefit. There is somewhere a stopping point. Ideally, the stopping point is determined by economics. And that means that governments are, instead of asked to subsidize maybe the, the postal sector, it would be very good to desubsidize, um, particularly CO2 emissions, which are in many, many countries still subsidized heavily. Um, that means energy items and certain resource items, which are heavily subsidized. In the moment you are, you're moving in the direction of reflecting the true costs. And maybe uh, if something is not worth sending it back, then economically, it might also not be worth environmentally. Because there is, of course, a point where you have to say, this goes too far. 
sending that, let's say, from an island in the Pacific back to a manufacturer in Europe for an item which incorporates whatever, 300 grams of CO2 is not worth it because getting it there might cost you 500. You know, there is a cutoff point and it would be nice if through reducing existing subsidies, mainly on the energy side, but also on the resource side, we would get closer to the actual cost reflecting quite accurate, accurately also the environmental cost, because then we have a system which balances, which would balance out itself. Back to you. Thank you for that, Stefan. Um, I was going to go on and on about uh, small items coming out of going through the post cross border, but I, we might then eat up the rest of our time with me ranting and raving about that. We, we've got some good questions that are coming in from uh, from the audience. I want to quickly uh, cover one of them, which was, oh gosh, I've lost it now. Don't tell me it's disappeared off my screen. Uh, talking about, here we go. Um, how can developing countries, sort of calling up on this topic of developing countries, how can they finance projects or get started, I suppose, in the circular economy? Uh, if you're in a, in a developing country where it's, yeah, the, 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 it's not as simple as flicking a switch, as we might have suggested earlier, to, to go to either net carbon zero in your delivery network. But anyway, enough of my ranting and raving. How to developing country, countries finance projects in this field? Janet, do you want to start with that one, please? I... <laughs> yeah, um, I was just trying to think of what projects, I mean, um, it might, Stefan might, might have more ideas because um, UNIDO is on the ground in so many countries, you know, they have these national offices um, that are financing or cooperating with a lot of question uh, countries. Uh, Stefan, do you want to take this one? Sure. After I elegantly pushed another one to you, I think it's only fair that I take this one. And it is actually, as you rightly say, Janet, uh, relatively close to our heart because we are doing projects in UNIDO. That's what we do a large part of our time. Uh, it, it depends what you want to do, uh, meaning it depends on how much knowledge and money you need to do something in your developing country. Um, capital, no, things which are relatively cheap, uh, relatively cheap is not cheap, but, you know, a um, couple of million dollars to actually get done. Uh, there are a large amount of, or a fair amount of donors who are specialized in uh, knowledge transfer, capacity building, piloting, whatnot, uh, which a couple of UN agencies and other players, including us, uh, provide access to if asked so in case of the UN, typically by a government and uh, in case of other entities also by others. But, you know, there is a there is a perception of a problem. You talk to one of these entities, which includes us in UNIDO, and uh, and then you have projects which will undertake substantial investment. Let's say you want to put, as James said, on in a country like, well, I don't want to give any specific example, in a country of medium size, you have the idea in the next five years, I would like to put on all of my distribution center solar panel and change all my distribution vehicles to electrical. Now this would cost you, say, I just grab a number, 150 million. Um, there are ways to create loan packages. It would be loan, but since circular economy is built on creating economic advantages, you would have to see possibly you can pay back that loan or otherwise you wouldn't do it, evidently. Um, there are loan packages for these uh, operators. They are not fixed. They would be assembled by a suitable development bank, for example, uh, in order to see how this could move forward and the two can be combined. Like if you're not quite sure you need the capacity to understand what you can do and which speed and so on, then you can talk to one of these development guys to help you with that. There are many instruments from really relatively small studies over bigger and bigger. And if you're at it, you might also look at what climate change does to you in terms of impact and whether you wanna to go to adaptation at the same time a bit, which is probably sensible. And then once you have figured that out, together with maybe uh, an implementer like us, UN or non-UN, it doesn't matter, then you go possibly, if a major investment is required, you go to one of these uh, international financial institutions. And there you are. It takes a little bit of time, but principally help is accessible for developing countries. Help is accessible. Back to you. 
And we'll leave you with uh, Stefan's phone number at the end. So <laughs> you, Stefan, a direct call. Um, climate uh, at unido.org is fine. Thank you. So just climate at unido.org. Now, um, James, get ready. I'm going to ask you one about one of your pet topics, which is packaging. Uh, Christine has asked, I'd like to hear more from the speakers about reducing the carbon impact with packaging. We mentioned earlier on about the boom in especially cardboard packaging. There's been a shortage of cardboard in some markets around the world. And who knows what really happens with that cardboard? Does it get recycled? Does it end up being uh, flung into a furnace? Who knows? What can we do? James. Oh, look, I, I think the, the first thing is, I mean, Janet told us what we can do, which is look at the different loops that we have available, right? What can you actually reuse locally or, or, you know, what can you then, you know, repurpose, you know, and so on until the worst version of like recycling. So I think there, there is some certain things there. I mean, we, I, I mentioned earlier, we, we worked, um, uh, you know, uh, in the very early days, um, you know, to, to, to look at compostable satchels. Or compostable mailers um, and you know that but that was actually very very exciting in the sense that they used to be home composted um, and I think that's that's great because it's very local of course what's interesting is you get to the next challenge of the labels right and you know it's not just the packaging it's also then the labels um, so you know again these things keep going what's also the other final little bit that's interesting though sometimes and this is I love it when technology and sustainability come together because we also know that some of those mailers are actually better in terms of sorting machines. So you get all these, these fascinating things, um, you know, they're, they're really beautiful. So, so that's mailers, you can think about, you know, um, you know corrugated um, cardboard, what can you do around that? Again, sometimes there's, um, there's programs where the, the, the sender is gonna take responsibility for that in some ways. Um, but basically, again, it comes down to this, you start by thinking about, okay, you know, get the data, watch the Pareto show, because everything's a Pareto, particularly in the world of, of, of logistics. I find it's more and more Paretos, and then you just start attacking those problems one by one. And of course, there's been a suggestion that uh, posts and delivery companies could incorporate, you talked about the first mile before, James, as part of their, their milk run would be to collect used packaging from people's doorsteps and bring it back and make sure it does get recycled properly instead of being put into the wrong recycling bin and things like that. There's also the uh, concept, we're seeing a few of these examples around the world of recyclable packaging. So a multi-use package that you then can either return to the sender or reuse yourself. And it can be used up to 50, 100, who knows how many times. Uh, Stefan, did you wanna make a comment on this? Just uh, to point into the direction with a little bit more emphasis that you just mentioned, the differences in packaging, I mean, cardboard packaging can be reasonably well and profitable recycled locally, I mean, relatively locally. And also, it still costs some resource. You need hot water, essentially, to do so, to produce new cardboard boxes. So there is a certain loss. Um, but the more specialized your packaging becomes, multi-layer, plastics, whatever, the more difficult it becomes with the recycling. And then, of course, uh, Postal service can consider whether they offer the mailers standardized packages instead of a multitude. The problem always is when you have 50 different packages and you have to sort them apart and you don't have quantities of any, and how do you recycle them, la la la. But if mailers and if postal companies would actually take over the responsibility to standardize that packaging further and then to possibly see to that after use it comes to the right goes into the right direction by potentially collecting it and then handing it over whether it's cardboard but also more complex packaging pouches whatever uh, that would be probably a very interesting role to substantially reduce their environmental impact back to you thank you Stefan and uh, please everybody so I hope you keep uh, your uh, questions coming in uh, and because Khalid, you've asked me a very long question. Give me a moment to read through it and try to digest it and we'll put some of it to, um, to, to the panel. Um, one of the things we talked earlier on uh, was or briefly mentioned was the idea of the opportunities presented to the postal world via the circular economy. So I just want to make sure that we've, we've covered off on this. We, I, I think that sometimes environmental stuff 
reducing emissions, going electric, solar panels, reducing electricity use in your sorting centres, all those sorts of things can be seen as punitive. Does that make sense? They're seen as something, well, it's a cost or it's, it's shuffled off to one side. Um, and I'd like to, so let's talk about the opportunities that are here um, with regards to the circular economy and whether it's a business opportunity or things like that. Um, would anybody like to sort of share what, what they think could be the opportunities, some definite upsides for the postal sector in terms of adopting principles of the circular economy or becoming an enabler of the circular economy? You've all got your thinking faces on. James, no? Go, Janet. Go, Janet. Go. Yeah. Um, well, I, the what I'm watching, I think it's quite interesting. I'm not sure if it's the most um, impactful, but it's data. Um, so we've got digital product passports coming in the EU and things go in and out of the EU. So presumably that's going to be the future, that all products will have um, a digital passport that contains information about its components, its origins, its materials, um, what should be done along the way, information for end of life, um, all this sort of stuff. And so um, at, Passports are there for, you know, moving across borders or, or, or um, to different places. So I think for me, it'll be interesting to see how the logistics sector engages with the digital product passport um, emergence. Is there going to be smart packaging? You know, are your stickers or your, um, your um, QR codes or however you communicate the information um, that you add to it? How will that link to the digital product passport? Will the nature of your logistics, the mode of transport, the carbon footprint, um, is that expected to be now added to the digital product passport so that people down the supply chain can account for um, the impact or lack thereof of the, the part of the logistics that you took on? Um, and then they say, you know, data is, is the new oil. Um, the, can't have a webinar without using that phrase. So, um, so it's also, what are you going to do with all that data that passes through your hands? I think it's also a very um, interesting and growing area over from my side. That's, I, I've never heard data is in your oil before, but I'm gonna use it now. That's fantastic. I feel like I'm the last kid in class to find out that, you know, Duran Duran is cool or something like that. But data is a huge discussion. Everybody's thinking, Duran Duran, who are they? The, um, the, the importance of data is hugely, it's, it's huge, not just domestically, but talking about cross-border. And obviously there's whole teams at the UPU dedicated to data. I know that various other organizations are looking at this. Stefan, do you want to comment on the passport um, concept that, uh, that Janet has just mentioned and sort of shed any more light on or have any other comments on it? Uh, there are advantages the, the, the trick is linking that, and I think Janet has done an excellent job linking that to uh, postal services. Um, very principally, I mean, if you look at how you can create value in the postal service or for the postal service, you, I would assume the three avenues are you're increasing your volume, you're increasing your prices, or you're decreasing your costs, right? So how can circular economy help you with any of these? And part of that is uh, or you create entirely new products as, as suggested by Janet, which are kind of anyway happening on the side, but might create value in itself like data. Um, I would think that circular economy will also both of your clients as well as of the postal entities themselves would also help you in actually getting better business cases. Definitely. I mean, James, in his business model, has made clear that circular economy can help you getting up a competitive and future-oriented business model in postal services, if I correctly understand what you're actually doing, right? So, so there is evidently money in that. Um, there is a lot of money. I mean, there will be an increase in traffic, without any doubt. Uh, from point to point. And uh, I would say there will be an increase in cost for very carbon intensive services. So if you find ways to reduce the carbon intensity of your offerings, your, your 
profits will increase or your losses decrease, depending. So I think circular economy has a lot of has a lot of things going for it there. On the data side, these passports will also be helpful to facilitate, and that points you towards customers, to facilitate then the overall operation of the circular economy. You will know as a sender, or you might know as a sender, how many pieces of equipment are where in the world that might need repair, remanufacturing, refurbishing. All of that information is not necessarily available to the manufacturer or potentially to a refurbisher, but it is somewhere in the system. If the postal service would find a way to make information like that available and a product, that might be actually quite interesting. I mean, I must say, I haven't thought it through before Janet's uh, comment, but the issue of data points to the issue of knowing where you can find value with your circular economy services in order to apply them and actually to generate income. And if the postal service, the postal service will have a lot of that data passing through and probably be the only entity where this data passes through. So it would be very interesting to consider whether one can make a business model out of it. Back to you. Thank you, Stefan. Now, uh, we had a question come through from Ellen. Uh, Ellen, thank you for your question. Uh, we've talked about posts performing an enabling role in the circular economy. Could posts take a more active role by partnering with multiple product creators and managing the returns process directly? Uh, using Stefan's fashion example, could posts partner with multiple fashion houses and manage the sorting of returns on behalf of the partner businesses to make the process more efficient and cost effective for all? So almost act as an aggregator. So instead of every fashion house having their own return center, have one fashion return center run by the post or managed by the post with the post's various pipelines coming into it. Uh, it's an interesting idea, Alan. Uh, does anybody want to comment on that, how, how it might work, whether it's practical? Um, maybe I can start with that one. Um, so that is a big business um, opportunity that is currently playing out. Um, there are some third parties that do that. So especially with large brands that, um, yeah, you didn't mention brands before. I don't know if it's taboo here. Um, can I name brands? Well, we have Sendal, so yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Name brands. I was, I was just uh, following Stefan's right. lead. Yeah, so so you have um, there are white label companies that do that. So what they will do is you'll be able to send your product back to the brand. So Patagonia, for instance, or Arcturix um, are using a company called Trove. And what they do is they take, they sort, they actually refurbish a bit so they can actually patch it up, clean it up, fix a zipper. And then it gets resold on the, um, the same company's uh, website without anyone knowing that a third party did all this for the brand. Um, how the logistics part of that plays out, I'm not 100% sure, but I do think that 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 there is a value in having an, a separate entity specialising in taking, sorting, refurbishing and bringing it back. And then there's also sort of intelligent pricing that happens. Um, and then I think Adidas does it as well um, on what is the price of the, the secondhand product. And then that third party can also um, help figure it out. Um, so that's at a white label. And then there's other companies doing it as a separate entity um, as well. You know, none come to mind. So it is a huge area. Do, do they partner with the post? I'm not 100% sure. So I might have to throw that one back to you, Ian. Oh, okay. you made a good point there about the um, that there are private, private operators who are already doing it. And this is one of the issues for posts is how free are they to do things other than delivering letters? We see some postal operators are quite restricted in what they can do. But is that restriction holding back other opportunities in their country uh, without naming names? But it, it's something that really regulators and legislators need to think about is can we empower the post to play a role in the circular economy, be an aggregator of some sort, create efficiencies in our own economy, will then unlock value for other private players. So it's a 
It's an interesting question. Um, James, did you want to add something quickly? Because we're running out of time. Well, I, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think it's a really interesting idea, but I think one of the things is does the post have to do it all? Or as you say, in you know, can we unlock value and build an ecosystem around that? As you know, we work very closely with Postal in one country. And frankly, I'm really sorry, we we'd love to work, but we haven't been able to work with Postal in another. And it's like, you know, really interesting. How do, can you open that up? Because I think, you know, the circular economy is so big. The prize is so big, right? And there's so many opportunities here for, for, for Postal, but also for partnership if we start becoming really innovative about how do we do that. The idea of partnership and how, how free the Post is to partner with others in what means and what methods is also a question that individual countries have to answer. And I'm not sure that we, I really want to be too prescriptive right now because people know that I've got certain viewpoints on certain things, but you can look at various posts around the world that offer delivery services on behalf of other delivery companies. You'll see that there are companies that, that, that might do first mile on behalf of others. There might be posts that do um, third party logistics. Now, if a, if a post is doing third party logistics, immediately they're partnering with other, they might be preparing at the warehouse it's being fed out into a non-postal delivery network. So there are different ways to look at this and this idea of partnering. And I've had a couple of questions have come in as well uh, in the Q&A, which we're not going to have time to get into today. We're talking about partnering at a global level. Who should the UPU partner with to enable the circular economy or to assist in individual postal networks enable the circular economy? I reckon that is probably a, a discussion for another time, perhaps, about how the UPU and the various other global bodies can get together to enable the, the, the circular economy at a local level um, and even making it smooth cross-border because we no longer live in a world of discrete nations, some people would say. Somebody, some will say that the nation state no longer exists. Well, that's obviously not the case. But in terms of e-commerce, e-commerce doesn't know a lot about borders. And now that borders are being put up in e-commerce, e-commerce is struggling a little bit to understand it. When we talk about things like the VAT on deliveries into the EU and things like that, a discussion for another day, because it's we've got about a minute left. Um, really quick comments from each of you before we wrap up, after to do some thank yous as well. So um, I might go in reverse order. I'll go, go Stefan, uh, first quick final 30 seconds from you, please. Um, thank you for the discussion. I think uh, for me, what became clear is that there are plenty of opportunities for postal operators to participate in and benefit from circular economy and um, very much looking forward to see how that is moving forward. And if UPU can play a role in that, very happy to give me a ring climate at circular economy is one of the uh, at unido it's one of the options circular economy at unido is another option.org but no i mean seriously uh um i think it's also for a un body a very interesting task to to distribute knowledge methodologies and to coordinate particularly in the transboundary logistical sector in order that experiences move, but also that systems, when we talk about data, you have compatibility questions, right? And it's not only the data, but it's a super good example. You need compatibility. And for compatibility, you need someone who is working on it. And presumably organizations like UPU would be great. Back to you. Standards are indeed a whole part of that discussion. James, a quick comment from you before we wrap up, please. Well, the three things, I think partnerships is really important. I think taking responsibility and taking action really early is super important. I think the final thing is, yeah, don't forget the arrows. That's the very heart of the circular economy. Don't forget the arrows. Data is the new oil. Uh, Janet, a final comment from you before we wrap up. Yeah, just that um, data and logistics, including reverse logistics, are really the fundamentals of the circular economy. It won't work without the logistics sector getting it right. Um, so it's a really important discussion that I hope continues um, amongst your networks. Thanks for having me here. So uh, just to, before we wrap up, I want to say a quick thank you to the whole team at the UPU, Katja and Co on the communication side have helped put this together and promote it. And also thank uh, the IT team, Olivia Bernier, Elio da Silva and Gilles Bez. And I'm really sorry that my pronunciation is terrible, but what can I say? Um, the uh, And uh, well, 
look, now I'm filling the screen, everybody. Isn't that wonderful for you? So thank you all very much for taking part today. Thank you for your attendance. I uh, thank you for your contributions via the Q&A. Uh, if you want to get in contact with any of our panellists, um, I don't know, just email Stefan. He shared his, his email address. <laughs> he's, he's waving his hand to say, no, no, don't do that. Um, thank you all very much for your involvement today, and it's such an important topic. Uh, if you want to continue the, the conversations in your own countries, please do, uh, and get in contact with the UPU if you need any support in moving this concept of the, the circular economy forward. I'm Ian Kerr. Thank you very much for joining us today, and we look, oh, remember to subscribe to the UPU voicemail podcast. Go to upu.int. That's upu.int for all the information about what the UPU does, the information about the UPU's voicemail podcast and other events like this that the UPU will be holding in 2022. Have a great Christmas or whatever it is that you celebrate and a happy new year. And we look forward to doing more of this for you in 2022. Bye, everyone.